We'll go ahead and get out your Bible. If you have one with you today, you can also follow along with an outline of today's message on the Bible.com Bible app under the events section of the app. You can also take this time to hashtag check in for charity for us on Facebook. If you haven't already checked in on Facebook, now's the time to do that. For every public Facebook check in we receive, we donate one dollar to the local charity of the month. And today's uh, this month's local charity is Bay Area Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity. So uh, make sure to check in to support that great ministry. If you need technical help with either of those things, the Bible app or finding the Wi-Fi password or the, you know, check in or anything, just ask somebody next to you. Ask your neighbor. I promise they'll be nice to you. Uh, you know, you can talk in church. That's allowed. So don't be afraid of people. Today, we are in right in the middle of our New Year's message series called Five Easy Steps to Wreck Your Life. Five Easy Steps to Wreck Your Life. We're on step number three of five. And so don't worry if this is your first time back to church this new year because, let's be honest, you are not alone. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but lots of people have not been here the first couple of weeks of the new year. And so you are not alone to jump in with this message series with us right here in the middle. Um, So just so you know... Uh, that you're not alone, and, and you can also don't have to panic, right, that, you know, oh, I've already missed the first two steps. What if I'm already making the first two mistakes? What if I'm well on the way to wrecking my life and I don't even know it right now? So don't worry. Don't freak out. We've got you covered on the, our podcast. You can listen for free. You can listen to the recording or on our website. You can watch it on YouTube or on our website as well, the video, the last two messages. But only listen to those messages if you want to change your life. Don't listen if you want everything to stay the same, right? So today we're on the third step of how to wreck your life. And in this one easy step, this one easy step, there are actually two faulty beliefs we're going to talk about today. Two faulty beliefs, two beliefs that are very closely related. That if we believe one or both of them, then we will wreck our lives. So step number three to wreck your life, if you're taking notes, starts with this. It starts with believe that now is better than later. Believe that now is better than later. When you want something, believe now is better than later. So here's what I mean by that. You know, of course, we are a people and a society who believe that now is better than later. When we want something, we want it now. Why wait for it, right? We don't like that word, wait. Who honestly likes the word wait? From the beginning of our lives, as young children, we are taught to hate the word wait. You know, kids have such a difficulty just grasping the concept of time in general and then, you know, when you say to them, no, now we can't play that game right now. We can't play it right now, but we will play it later. Well, you might have just told them that you're never going to play that game ever again for the rest of their lives. You know, because they just don't understand it. And waiting is just the hardest thing for them to do as children. And we don't get very much better when we become adults either. When we want something we believe now is better, we live and love, we live for and love immediate gratification. We want it Whatever it is, right now. You know, we've developed a whole industry around this thing. We have on-demand movies, on-demand TV. We don't have to wait for anything anymore. We we can't even wait at a stoplight anymore. We're such bad waiters, right? When we wait at a stoplight, what do we do? We pull out our device, right? We start looking at Instagram, which is instant photos. Kids can't wait for photos to be developed or anything. When our phone dings, we instantly check the text. Even if we're driving, right, we instantly check the email, we interrupt whatever it is we're doing, whoever it is we're with, whatever date we're on, we interrupt it, we look at our phones, because when we want something we believe now is better than later, and we can't wait, we don't know how to wait. We can't wait to buy things, right? When we want the product, we want the product before we have to pay for it, right? So it doesn't matter that if in just a month or two, if we just wait just a little bit, we can save up the money, we can pay for it in cash. No, we, we buy it now and we just put it on the credit card and that's why we're all in debt. We want to live the life of a rich person now before we're actually rich, right? And so when we grow up and we move out of our parents' house, we instantly want the same standard of living that our parents achieved, but, but it took them 30 plus years of working to achieve that standard of living. But as soon as we get out of college, as soon as we move out of the house, we want that standard of living right then and there because we don't want to wait till later. You know, we want to live together now before and get married later. We want the milk for free before we buy the cow, don't we? We want physical intimacy now instead of waiting until later because real intimacy, emotional intimacy, spiritual intimacy, that takes so much more time to develop and we have to wait so long for that intimacy. We want physical intimacy now. We, we jump into a relationship with Mr. or Mrs. right now instead of waiting for Mr. or Mrs. right we want food to be fast, right? Food. We want 
we prefer fast food over slow food, right? My sister just bought me an Instant Pot for Christmas as a Christmas gift. It's a really cool gift, actually. I don't know if you've heard of, who's heard of an Instant Pot or have one of these things. Yeah, pretty cool little thing. And we've made a lot of meals with it. We really like it. But basically, an Instant Pot is like a slow cooker, but fast. It's a fast cooker, right? And so it's basically exactly the same as a slow cooker, only fast. And so we like it because it's faster than the slow cooker. And, and so... Uh, everything we eat, you know, pre-seasoned, pre-heated, pre-cut, pre-cooked. So all we have to do is just consume, right? We don't have to wait till later. We don't have to, it doesn't matter even if that stuff that, that we eat is killing us later or will kill us later. It tastes pretty sweet right now. Yeah. And so that's why we're going to eat it now. <laughs> the fact is we don't have to wait for very much anymore in our society. But the things that we can get right now, the things that we can get right now without waiting are often <coughs> cheap imitations of the real thing. Cheap imitations of the real thing. Some things that seem sweet now will quickly sour later. Some things that seem like a good idea now are a bad idea for the future. Sometimes the easy road, road is not the best road. And later on, down the road, it will bring <coughs> difficulty and get hard. So it, it's not... It, it, Right now is the, the beginning of a new year, and right now you're actually making decisions that don't just affect today and tomorrow, but they affect the rest of your year. So don't just think about the decisions that you make that affect right now, today, but think about the decisions that you're making that affect December 31st of 2017. Resolve to wait for God's best this year. Resolve to wait for God's best. God's best later is better than your best right now. God's best later is better than your best right now. Hold out for God's best, which might not come now, but it will come later. We're promised that in the scripture. Resolve to follow God's ways this year, which often make us wait for the very things that this world and this society tell us to take right now. God often tells us to wait, and so resolve to wait for God's best. Now, the entire story of Christianity is really a story about waiting for God's best. We are constantly waiting on God and as we read that in the scripture. That God's people are constantly waiting on God. Rarely in the scripture does God ever give people immediately what they want. You know, those things are called miracles when God does that. And they're sort of few and far between. I don't know if you experience a miracle in your everyday life. I don't. You know, it sometimes takes a long time to achieve or to receive what God has for us, his best for us. So we must wait patiently. And somehow, as sweet as instant gratification is to us, somehow the thing that we've waited patiently for when we finally receive it is so much sweeter than that thing that we receive instantly. It tastes sweeter when we wait. Uh, if, if, if we want to keep wrecking our lives, we've got to learn this principle of waiting because now is not always better than later. We must wait for God's best. Psalm 27 verse 13 says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. We are waiting for the land of the living. The day when God will restore this world and there will be no more death. We are waiting for that. We wait. Lamentations 3 verse 22 uh, starts with this. It says, because of, the Lord, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his pa compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, see, sometimes we have to say these things to ourselves. We have to remind ourselves of these truths. We have to preach good news to ourselves through the scripture. He says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Good things come to those who wait for the Lord. James writes in chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, Be patient then, dear brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And then Paul writes 
In Romans chapter 8, verse 22, we seem to always be coming back to Romans chapter 8 in this church because of its constant reminder to never give up hope in the face of suffering or difficulty. God will make things right. That's what Romans 8 tells us. Though we want things to change right now, though we whine and we groan for God to change something in our lives, you know, though we want salvation now, if we just wait a little bit longer, we'll get what we need. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 22. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we will wait patiently for it. We may want to see salvation right now. right? We may want it right now, but instead we wait. And while we wait, we get hope. We get hope for our salvation to come in the future. And life is somehow better not when we receive immediately what we've always wanted. But life is somehow better with hope with hope that we will receive the goodness of salvation. And hope is only present, Scripture tells us, hope is only present while we wait. That's when we have hope, when we wait. We cannot believe that now is always better than later. We have to wait for God's best. Now, the second mistake, mistake we believe is, is the equal and opposite error of that one, of believing that now is better than later. The second mistake is believing that later <coughs> is better than now. And this belief surfaces for us, right, like when we see very important things, good things, better things in life that we should be doing now, but we put off until later. Things that God has told us to do now, but we put them off until later. You know, things that, I'll do those things later. You know, I know they're important. I'll get to them. Uh, but right now, I've got even more important things. I've got more urgent things to take care of right now. So we think I'll, I'll give later when I'm more financially secure. We think I'll go to church later when I have more time in my schedule, when it's not football season maybe anymore. You know, I'll serve my community later when I'm retired and I have more time on my hands. You know, I'll start that diet on Monday later after I gorge out to eat at Gringo's. You know, I'll start that. I'll, I'll save money later after I buy this new car, YOLO, right? You know what I mean? We, well, this is the worst one. You know, I'll, I'll wait. I'll, I'll continue to work long, long, hard hours away from my family so that later I can stay home with them, right? The problem with thinking that later is better than now is that you might not get a later. That you might not ever get a later. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. And James, the brother of Jesus, uh, writes in James chapter 4, and he warns us about putting off God's ways until later. In verse 13 of chapter 4, James, the brother of Jesus, writes, look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there for a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. And did you hear that sobering question that he asked in verse 14? How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. You may never get a later. And then in the last verse that we read, verse 17, it, it can be taken on its own, and it's a great moral prescription for us, a powerful message for us. It says, remember, remember it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. In other words, at any time in your life, right, if you know the right thing to do but you don't do it, then you've just sinned. You may not have necessarily done the wrong thing, but you didn't do the right thing. It's, it's sometimes called a sin of omission, right? You knew the right thing, and you didn't do it. 
That's verse 17, and it, it's a great message if it stands all alone, on its own. But taken in the context of the rest of the passage that we just read, it takes on this additional meaning for us. The implication of verse 17 in its context tells us that sometimes we put off things that we know God wants us to do now, planning instead to do them later. So you could read this verse this way. Remember it is a sin to know what you ought to do now, and then not do it till later. Our plans for today must be God's plans for us today. We cannot live as if right now we have more important things to do than to follow God's plans for us. Right now, you know, I've got a business to run. Right now, I've got a family to raise. Right now, I've got an education to earn. Right now, I've got money to make. Right now is just not a good time for that mission stuff. I'll get to that other stuff. I'll get to that God stuff later. But right now, I've got my list to do. I've got, I've got my plans and my priorities to get to. I've got my agenda. I'll get to that God stuff later. Just as we have to wait for God's best, we also have to act for God first. We have to act for God first. God's plans for our lives come first. God's ways come first. We give to God our first. We must never tell God to wait till later while we fill, fulfill our own plans first. When God asks us to do something, we must not respond with, that's fine, God, but first, but first, Jesus warns us of responding with, but first, in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57. Luke writes, As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, Come, follow me. The man agreed, but, but he said, Lord, first, he said, but first, but Lord, first, let me return home and bury my father. Verse 60, but Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I, I will follow you. And what's the next phrase? He says, I will follow you, but first, but first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, Anyone who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, this passage sounds kind of harsh to us that Jesus would say these words about us. You know, aren't we all just really trying hard, God? Isn't that what you want? You know, Jesus is really holding us to a pretty high standard here. It, but really, it's, it shouldn't be that harsh. It's just about not putting off God till later and putting God first. That's really the, the crux of this passage. Before we put God first, before our traditions... But we put God first before our other responsibilities, before our family's comfort, before our own plans. This passage is about putting God first. We must act for God first. We wait for God's best. We act for God first. Maybe this passage seems a little bit harsh to us because we really know that we don't really put God first. Yeah, we put him among the firsts. We, we, prior, we put him with the other priorities, but he's not the priority. He's not the first in our life. We often put other priorities, other responsibilities, other people first, and we put God off until later. You know, it's completely normal. You are not alone. It's one of the common, easy, easy steps that we all make, but it's how we all write our lives. When it comes to God later, it's not better than now. When God calls us to do something now, we can't put it off till later. You know, what might God be calling you to do now that you've been putting off till later think about your own life you know what challenge has my god be extending to you now what step of faith is he asking you to take in your life right now what plans does he have that he's telling you to do and you keep telling him fine but later what's he asking you to do now you know, I struggle with this all the time. You know, I'm not great at, at hearing the voice of God. I know I'm a pastor. I know I'm supposed to just like walk outside and see the clouds part and, and you know, the spirit of the Lord descend like a dove and God say to, to me, Andrew, this is your father speaking to you. You know, I'm, I know that's how I'm, you think that it happens in my life. It's not the way it happens. You know, sometimes I just get a thought that, that races across my mind, that flits across my brain. You know, some thought, some idea, and, and it's like, go talk to that person or Go outside and, and check your mail or go to this restaurant or go invite this person to lunch or go invite this person to church or say hello to this person. And, and these thoughts kind of come to my mind. And, you know, I think, is that God telling me to do something? 
or is that just a random idea that I had? And so I think about it, and I deliberate for a little while, and I think, and I kind of weigh the circumstances, and I'm thinking, maybe that's God's voice, maybe it's just an idea. And before you know it, now has become later. And now I've missed my chance to talk to that person or to go to that thing. And I wonder, did I miss my opportunity to act? I wonder if I've missed my opportunity to follow God's instructions like I put my hands to the plow, but then I look back. And when we become followers of God, when we claim to be followers of Jesus, and Jesus says, walk this way, we can't tell him later, later, without losing step with him, without him getting farther and farther out in front of us. But, but Jesus is, if Jesus is way out far in front, we're falling way behind. We may be followers of Jesus, but now he's starting to look really small. We must act for God first. Now is not always better than later, and later is not always better than now. We must wait for God's best. We must act for God first. So whatever it is that you're, you're waiting on, as you try to follow God's ways, whatever it is you're waiting for God to do in your life, keep waiting I, I promise you it'll be worth it. Wait for him. Wait for God's best. Don't give up on him. God's best is coming for you. Whatever it is that you're waiting on before you start to follow Jesus, or maybe before you actually start to follow him more closely, then whatever plans or agenda or priorities you've been putting ahead of God, put them off to later and put God first. Because you are not guaranteed a tomorrow. Now, this is why it's so crucial that we, we follow Jesus now and we follow him every day for the rest of our lives. You know, I'm not trying to scare you or anybody else. I'm not trying to, you know, to rush any spiritual journey that you might be on or any questions that you might be going through or any, you know, uh, doubts that you have. I just want you to be aware that this is important stuff that deserves to take priority in your life. Don't think I'll get to that Jesus stuff later after I've lived a little in life. If you're waiting till later, if you're waiting till the end of your life, for example, to you know, ask for forgiveness on your deathbed, and then you get to go straight to heaven, and then you got to live however you want before that, then you completely miss the point of the gospel. You completely misunderstand what the gospel is all about. The gospel means good news. The gospel of Jesus is good news. Following Jesus means you know, pursuing him closer and closer and closer each day means real, abundant, full life today and for eternity. Not just after we die, but today and for eternity. John 10.10 says, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose, Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. In other words, it's life without Jesus, life before Jesus that's missing out. It's it's life before Jesus where we're, we're letting our sins and the devil and the world, whatever you want to say, steal and kill and destroy our lives. But life with Jesus, that's where the rich and satisfying life is really found. And why wait to be richly satisfied? Why wait to the end of your life for that? Why wait till later when you can have a rich and satisfying life right now? So we're about to receive the Lord's Supper together. And as we do that, I want you to let that meal, that bread dipped in juice, let it be an invitation to you. An invitation. Let it be an invitation to accept Christ's death for you. As you accept that bread dipped in juice into your body, and you accept Jesus' forgiveness, his death for you. You don't have to wait to begin following Jesus. You know, you don't have to, to wait to have it all figured out. You don't have to wait till you have all your questions answered or every doubt sufficed. You know, you don't have to wait till you've cleaned up your life. You can come just as you are, no matter who you are, to receive forgiveness, to receive new life, just by saying yes to Jesus. And it's a meal that we do every week to remind us to continue to say yes to Jesus week after week, day after day of our life, minute after minute, moment after moment, yes to Jesus and his plans for our lives. So if you'd like to stop waiting and begin following Jesus, then uh, I invite you just to bow your head with me and tell God that very thing. You can pray something like this in the quiet of your heart. You know, God hears the thoughts of your heart. 
You don't have to even speak a word out loud. God will hear you. Loving God, I'm so sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me even while I was still a sinner. Thank you for saving me. I now receive your forgiveness. I accept your salvation. I give you my life. I want to follow you today as my Lord. So today, please fill me with your spirit. Make me new. In Jesus' name, I pray. And for all of us here today, we pray, God, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this meal we call the Lord's Supper. Please join us at this meal. May your Holy Spirit come and fill this bread and juice and make it be for us like your body and your blood. So as we eat it, we would be filled with your spirit, filled with your love, filled with real life, a rich and satisfying life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Won't you join?